Good morning. I'd like to thank everybody for coming, coming out in this weather. I hope it wasn't too much trouble and the roads will be okay once you get back. Um, my name is Heather Stanford. I'm with the Society of Petroleum Engineers and the Energy for Me program. Um, I'm very excited that you are all here and we have a great day planned. So I want you to be all prepared to learn and have some fun today. I want to start off by um, recognizing uh, some of the organizers for ATC Teacher Workshop last year. I'd like uh, Mauricio Ramboldi to stand up. We held our teacher workshop first time ever um, in Italy, and he coordinated with the Museum of Science and Technology with the Leonardo da Vinci Museum of Milan. So we were, he was very instrumental in pioneering in that area. Thank you so much. I also want to, um, I would like to um, introduce Sujata Batia. She is external engagement advisor of Exxon Mobil Company, the sponsor of this event, and we really appreciate her and her company. She's one of the sponsors that make this event great. So I want to give her a hand and welcome her. Thank you, Heather, for the introduction. And on behalf of ExxonMobil, I want to thank uh, the Society of Petroleum Engineers for hosting the event. It's truly a privilege to talk to such a distinguished group of teachers. My mother and father were both professors, and I have a daughter. So I know the power that each of you have in shaping the lives of students. In fact, I was inspired to become an engineer by a wonderful calculus teacher I had in high school. This has led to the 20-year career I've had with ExxonMobil. So thank you for taking the time to come and enhance your skills even further so that you can continue to have that kind of impact on your students. The focus of the workshop today is the science of energy. We hear a lot about oil and gas and nuclear and renewables. But how does it all work? And how does that oil in the ground transform into the gasoline that fuels our cars? The National Energy Education Development Project is here to tell you precisely that. And in talking with many of you, I've heard that NEED has put on other very helpful <coughs> programs here. So I hope we are able to introduce you to new and exciting ways that you can demonstrate to your students how energy works today. Lacking an understanding of the science of energy can really lead us to take it for granted. And energy is an integral part of our lives and will continue to be far into the future. Every year, ExxonMobil prepares an outlook for energy supply and demand. This outlook is compiled from data from more than 100 countries, and it shows that we expect global energy demand will be almost 35 percent higher in 2030 than in 2005. 35 percent, that's a huge number. And this can be attributed to improvements in global living standards and an expanding world economy. The good news is, there are plenty of traditional sources of energy remaining for the foreseeable future. Oil, natural gas, and coal will remain the most significant sources of energy, but renewable forms of energy, such as biofuels and wind, are growing rapidly and will also contribute more as they become more economically competitive. Why is all of this important? Well, we need to figure out who is going to develop the technology to meet these growing energy challenges. ExxonMobil employs more than 16,000 scientists and engineers. Clearly, science and engineering are important to us. And we need your help to encourage the current and future generations of students to pursue careers in math and science. Last year, I had the opportunity to talk with Dr. Sally Ride and provide feedback to the collaborative effort between ExxonMobil 
and, the Dr. Sa and Dr. Sally Ride. And this collaborative effort is named the Sally Ride Science Academy. The issue at hand was why so many students, girls in particular, seem to be disinterested in science. The academy is dedicated to helping teachers raise students' interest in science. The program is based on research. And as an engineer, the findings, honestly, are disheartening. Consider that the National Center for <coughs> Education Statistics found that 68% of fourth grade boys and 66% of fourth grade girls self-report they like science. That seems pretty good, right? That's about two-thirds of fourth grade students, and it's as many boys as girls. But fast forward to fifth grade the interest level starts to drop off, and they start to drop off in large numbers amongst girls. So what's behind the sun drop? It's not as simple as disinterest or lack of aptitude. It's something more complex, something embedded deeper in our society. And uh, one of the questions we asked at the Sally Ride Science Academy was, we asked young children that attended the academy to draw a picture of a scientist. And uh, I'm sure all of you have in your mind what you would draw, but think about what they may draw. They drew Albert Einstein, undoubtedly one of the greatest science minds to ever live, but practically unrelatable to children. And they drew another type of scientist as well, and they drew him like a mad scientist with his hair sticking out and all over the, pla all over the place. So, you know, are we surprised that children don't want to picture themselves as gray-haired, wrinkled old men in white lab coats? So part of today is to show kids that science is a diverse discipline with tons of exciting career opportunities. We have to provide them with real-life examples of these jobs and introduce them to real people who perform them. And by showing them a wide range of science-related opportunities, we can really begin to change students' perspectives. If we know we have high level of interest in science in fourth grade, we start there and we continue to present positive and diverse images <coughs> of science, technology, math, engineering, or STEM careers throughout their schooling. Once we're able to get students to see that science is cool and to realize all the opportunities and careers that science offers, students will begin to view science in a more positive light. As a company that absolutely depends on scientists and engineers to stay in op operation, ExxonMobil has a stake in facilitating this change. ExxonMobil is a global company and we invest in STEM initiatives everywhere we do business. For example, uh, in 2007, we committed $125 million to the National Math and Science Initiative, or NIMSI. This is a nonprofit entity created to facilitate the scale up of programs that have demonstrated improvement in math and science education. And many of you may have already heard of NIMSI. NIMSI started in Texas with two proven programs. The first is AP Strategies, and it's a training and incentive program for advanced placement and pre-advanced placement courses. It's designed to increase the number of educators capable of instructing these valuable college preparatory courses, as well as to encourage students and support them. Uh, since its inception, AP Strategies has trained nearly 900 AP students and more than 7,800 pre-AP teachers in more than 550 schools in numerous states. Within five years, NIMSI will have an additional 150 districts in 20 states implementing this program. And that translates into more than 50,000 students scoring a three or higher on AP exams in math, science, and English. And this is more than otherwise would have. That's pretty remarkable. Scoring well on these exams makes students more competitive for acceptance into college. It also provides them an advantage upon enrollment because many colleges <laughs> offer class credit and exemption in exchange for passing scores. The second NIMSI program that many of you may also be familiar with is UTeach. And I'm also involved in this particular program. 
and it encourages math and science majors to enter the teaching profession by offering an integrated degree plan, financial assistance, and early teaching experience. NIMSI plans to build on the successes they've had at UT and assist more than 50 universities in adopting UTeach type programs nationwide. By 2020, the goal is to have more than 10,000 graduates of these programs, and they'll be able to impact more than 3 million students. That's an entire generation of young Americans. They'll have the opportunity to be inspired to pursue math and science careers. Another visible element for support for math and science education is the Mickelson ExxonMobil Teachers Academy. It's a joint initiative between ExxonMobil and golfer Phil Mickelson. The academy trains elementary school teachers on innovative teaching methods and hands-on applications of math and science. These are just a few of the programs that ExxonMobil supports because we know programs like these are great tools to get kids motivated to continue to study math and science as they get older. But being here today shows your commitment to the cause. And I'm reminded of a quote by Pulitzer Prize winning poet, writer and critic, Mark Van Doren, who once said, the art of teaching is the art of assisting discovery. You should all take pride in knowing that your dedication to providing superior instruction will shape the future career choices of our nation's youth. I really hope you find today's activities interesting and rewarding, and thank you again for participating. Thank you, Sujata. <coughs> Next, we have our keynote presentation, our keynote presenter, Ron Hinn. He's vice president of PetroSkills. He will be talking about today's energy challenge. <coughs> Good morning, everyone. Good morning. We, uh, we call this conference at SPE the fall conference. As I was walking down from the hotel this morning, this is the winter conference. You have uh, welcomed us in a big way. So today, when you have a chance to go out onto the exhibit floor, you're going to see a lot of people from the southwest and other parts of the world that don't get to experience snow. So this is very special for them. But I want you to walk by them, because they're going to have big eyes, big buggy eyes going to be a little bit concerned about how they navigate in the snow. Just pat them on the back and assure them that everything will be okay and that uh, they'll be able to survive uh, this winter weather. Well, I appreciate Heather and SPE, ExxonMobil, for the opportunity to come before you and, and offer this uh, keynote. This is an opportunity for uh, us to set the stage for your day. Um, you are going to have some exposure to uh, some neat learning resources from NEED. Uh, you're also going to have the chance to go into one of the finest technical exhibits that occurs annually around the world as you go into the convention center and see the vast array of technology that is being used to explore, produce, uh, and to optimize production, primarily the fossil fuels, from uh, the subsurface. And, and hopefully today you will be awed and you will be inspired. inspired Number one, by the energy that you see as you go out on the exhibit floor. The individuals that are here care about technology, they care about science, they care about the application of that to meet the world's energy needs. Now they make a business around that and there is a profit that is made, but these are individuals who just 15 and 20 years ago were in the very classrooms that you are teaching. So today we come before you to get you pumped up about the future and able to communicate some of the future, some of the opportunities that exist for the students that you're engaging and encourage them, as Sanjay was saying, to think about careers uh, in the energy business. Need focuses on all types of different energy supplies. My talk, my background, my history is relative to the fossil fuel side, primarily the hydrocarbon, oil and gas business. So my remarks today are more encapsulated in that. But I also am not naive in thinking that our, our 
solutions for future energy supply. And Sanjay gave you the target, 35% increase in energy needs around the world projected by the year 2030. That solution to meet that energy demand is going to require sources that are outside of the hydrocarbon fuels also. We have our challenges to maintain supply in the hydrocarbon business, but all of the other energy sources, the wind, the solar, the geothermal, the hydro, et cetera, all of those will come into play also. So we're going to take a little uh, quick tour th through some statistics, not to bore you, but to hopefully encourage you and challenge you, give you some, some things that might be thought-provoking that you can put in front of your students to uh, challenge them. Uh, and then we're going to look at some of the technologies that are being deployed, some of the challenges that we have in the industry, some of the, the hurdles that have to be jumped in order for us to meet that target of the energy demand that we project for 2030. So the focus of the, uh, the talk today is around these four themes. Politics, nothing that happens within our business absent politics. Uh, you hear about it day in and day out. Irrespective of the party or parties that you are representative of, there is a political stance that is taken. As we go into in the United States, the presidential election year, energy will be a big part uh, of that discussion and the platforms of the various parties. So we can't have discussions apart from the political discussion. We will talk about the value of energy. I have fun talking about that because it takes it away from a, a price discussion to one of value and how, how valuable is energy. There are some hard truths. Uh, we don't have an unlimited supply of hydrocarbons, and so we'll, we'll tackle some of those. And then, of course, we come back to the reason solutions. How are we going to meet some of these demands that uh, are being foisted upon us by the growth of companies around the world? So let's have some fun first. How valuable is oil? To the chemists, some of you may be chemistry teachers, to the chemistry uh, class, as you talk about hydrocarbons, uh, hydrocarbons are molecules, and they make, they're made up of two elements, a hydrogen and a carbon. The lightest hydrocarbon is methane. In our engineering vernacular, we talk about methane as being C1, one carbon with four hydrogen. We then move down that molecular chain, C2 ethane, C3 propane, C4 butane, C5 pentane, and you can continue down to you get very, very long hydrocarbon chains, C100 plus in the associated hydrocarbons and the different configurations of the models. So to the chemist, this is how they think of hydrocarbon. To the consumer, this is how they think of hydrocarbon. It's a visual of the gas pump and an individual pulling up to the gas pump and it says, please insert your credit card and enter the make and model of your car followed by your annual salary and then the machine comes back and says, your loan has been approved, you can pump your gas. And for many of our consumers, their understanding of hydrocarbons relates simply to the engagement that they have at the gas pump. <clears throat> How much am I paying for that gasoline? And my basis for understanding the hydrocarbon business revolves around that interaction and that interaction only. For individuals in the industry, who are ambassadors for this industry for you, who uh, teach about the supply, energy supply, and hydrocarbons is a part of that. The knowledge of the value of oil is critical, and it needs to get